How do you guys normally start? Do you give some time for all the participants to join or do you have uh, um, to just start sharp at um, the time? <laughs> Uh, sorry, we just uh, give a few minutes uh, that adequate uh, number of participants uh, if they are joining and then we uh, will uh, start sharp at 7.5. I think that will be um, acceptable. Vastis um, is having a trouble logging in. He, uh, the Zoom is asking the password and the password in the link isn't recognizing as incorrect. So, so I am guiding him. Uh, are you able to guide him? Yes, uh, let me try. Okay. I think it could be because uh, I have attended those Zooms before, but Sebastian is not registered in this group. So could it be the reason? Mm. The uh, For login, it needs uh, um, to join, it needs login. So if anyone having uh, login uh, and already registered with Zoom, then he can join easily. And let me check if I can uh, modify uh, some security. Just let me call him and check with him if what is the real problem.
Assalamualaikum. Dr. Asma. Hello. Yes. Uh, are you there? Yeah, we just we are just having some um, um, Zoom issue. So just give us another three or four minutes. Okay. Uh, for anyone who is a new user to Zoom uh, and is not signed up, so please convey them to sign up and then sign in. It will allow uh, after uh, appropriate signing in. Okay. All right. So just give me five minutes to figure this out. Sorry about okay. that. No, no problem. Okay, so we are um, ready to go. Um, Dr. Daspal is uh, signed under my username. So his name will appear as like second Asman Oshirwan on the list. So of the participants. Um, so are we good to go? Yes, please. Awesome. So um, thank you everybody for um, um, giving my team the opportunity to present today to such, such an esteemed group of physicians and so enthusiastic learners. Sorry, just one second. Dr. Daspal is calling there. Um, we are, uh, my name is Asma Nasharwan. I'm a, a neonatologist um, and I uh, belong to Pakistan. I studied in uh, um, Fatma Jannah Medical College um, quite a few years ago. Um, and I was a student for Dr. Khalid Kamal and that's how I got introduced to this group. My um, team is, um, we, are, we are the neonatal team in uh, Jim Patterson Children's Hospital. It's the hospital in Saskatoon. And for those who um, don't know where the Saskatoon is, don't feel under pressure because my family cannot even say the word Saskatoon, even though I'm living here for over four years. We are um, in one of the prairie provinces in Western Canada. And um, our center has, um, um, is a referral site for general pediatrics and subspecialties in our province. Um, Sas we, so our province is called Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan is famous for the um, clear skies and the northern lights and a lot more. Um, we have in our NICU, we have 48 uh, beds and uh, all our single family rooms. We have um, integrated NICU cameras in each room. Um, we have uh, quite a wide variety in our team with all the experts and our main uh, vision we can say is around 
um, um, uh, adapting to the new technologies and um, offering best care um, to those sick newborns and uh, uh, striving for the best quality of life um, for them. Um, in terms of our stats, we are, uh, uh, as I said, 48 beds. We have an 11 bed level two NICU, um, which uh, is our draining nursery for, uh, and it is one hour north from Saskatoon. Uh, we get 8,000 in-house deliveries and up to 1,800 admissions to NICU. Our faculty is um, six full-time neonatal position and six uh, clinical associates. They are also called middle grades in other regions. We have nurse practitioners and we also uh, support the education and training of pediatric residents um, uh, through the University of Saskatchewan. Um, neonatologists and clinical associates, we all have uh, uh, university affiliations, and we are quite actively in, involved in academia. Right now, we are going through the process of accreditation, and we are hoping that within the next 24 months, we will be able to advertise our uh, neonatal uh, perinatal fellowship positions um, nationally for uh, through the Royal College of Canada. In terms of our services, we have um, antenatal counseling for high-risk pregnancies. We have 24-7 neonatal transport, and we do up to 200 transports a year for uh, um, um, mostly for uh, 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 retrieval service. Uh, we have a very strong nutritional and feeding program and uh, an ICU follow-up clinic. Um, our point of care ultrasound, which we are gonna hear all about today, and last but not the least, patient safety and um, quality improvement. These are a few milestone pictures of our team. Uh, we have moved to uh, the top ones being when we left our old facility three years, two and a half years ago, and, um, um, and few retirement photographs. And in this moment, it is, um, uh, it, we cannot just not talk about our retired and senior uh, staff who has dedicated their lives to create those pathways for us to work on um, for stri uh, striving for excellence, basically. Um, I have with me um, Dr. Daspa. He is, um, um, some of you may know him from um, England. Um, he has, he's our medical director uh, for NICU and also for NICU follow-up program. Um, he, for his pediatrics, he is trained in uh, between Scotland and England, and he then he received his neonatal fellowship from uh, University of Alberta, which is uh, one of our neighboring province in Canada. And um, he has an extensive experience in using ultrasound for hemodynamics, lung, and uh, organ perfusion. And um, I must say that um, um, our institutional vision is around working together to make care better every day and for everyone. And working on those same principles, he has um, worked very, very hard to expand our point of care ultrasound. Um, he has inspired us and many others um, with his skill of um, in, uh, including everybody in those processes and uh, um, also being very creative around teaching, training, and integrating it into the clinical care. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Daspal, and I'm going to stop sharing so that he can take over. And because he's logged in as uh, myself, so, so I have to stop sharing the video as well. After Dr. Dasma. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'm just gonna start sharing my slides. Uh... All right, you can see my slides now, right? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right. Okay, so uh, good morning from Canada, Saskatchewan, and probably some of you are good evening. So thank you very much for inviting us 
asma and us and, and i to you know uh, to be part of this um, awesome um, webinar series you guys do i've heard a lot of about you and thank you asma for giving me an excellent <laughs> a phenomenal um, introductions yes i probably have inspired a few people but some of my <laughs> professor used to say maybe i have scared some of them um, with my uh, uh, over enthusiasm maybe somehow you know some people call me uh, uh, on my point of care ultrasound so today uh, we are going to talk about point of care ultrasound in in icu as a whole like as a um, just as a general so you now know me very well uh, i'm in saskatchewan in, in saskatoon so before i start i just want to uh, you know, share this word of wisdom, if, if you, if I, if I may, that uh, and the focus, the point of care ultrasound is is it cannot exist without a clinical assessment. So this is my one line summary of the whole presentation. That clinical assessment is the foundation of the focus. It has to be the foundation of the focus. So what we're going to talk today, we're going to talk about a little bit of the background and the history of the point of care ultrasounds because without knowing our history, we cannot understand the present. And of course, we cannot build a strong future. Now we'll talk about our point of care ultrasound programs at Jim Parison Children's Hospital in Saskatoon. And, and I'm going to try to build a kind of a, a sense of confidence in, in all of you to, to show that the point of care ultrasound does help in clinical scenarios. So we'll have some cases. And of course, at the end, we're going to talk about how we trained ourselves, how we certified ourselves, and how we are continuing our um, um, competencies. So the background and the history of the focus uh, is, is probably all of you know that I think, in my opinion, I think the head ultrasound scans were the first one to be performed by the neonatologist. Now, most of the European unit where I train in England and Scotland, the neonatologist is, is, is still there doing ultrasounds, although the radiology departments are now currently doing their department per scan probably once a week, but still the neonatologist and the neonatal trainees, the, the registrar, they are learning the skills. These scans are mostly done for, you know, um, big IVH and probably some periventricular leukomalacia, but there was not much use of the cranial Doppler studies. Um, only in few centers, as I've worked in Bristol and Glasgow, they were using it before the cooling to include or to exclude in some borderline cases. And of course, um, with other trials like drift trial and Elvis trial, people were using it to understand the uh, uh, raised ICP. So Dopplers were not routinely used. Now, you, you all know that the head ultrasound scan, there are multiple courses, multiple workshops, two days, basic course, three days, advanced course, and um, by London Group, there are millions of courses available. But I never seen a kind of formal structure over time. And that's something I thought, you know, we were missing. And um, echocardiography was similarly was done by only few neonatologists and they had some training or they probably learned on the job and they were kind of you know um, keeping in touch with the cardiology colleague and they were doing their um, um ultrasound but again there was no um um see you know serious training program i have seen or i have come across in europe other than those couple of days or three days workshops and that is exactly what i have done when i was in uk in Glasgow, they offered five to seven days a uh, workshop and I attended that. And then you start doing it and you talk to your cardiologist and your seniors and show them your picture. That's how you got trained. Lung ultrasound scan was completely out of the picture. And even the radiologist, they will only do lung ultrasound scan for pleural effusions uh, or impima, and that was it and nothing else. Now, the neonatologist starting doing echocardiography officially or more focused i think it's all started in australia and new zealand uh, you, you probably know those guys martin Kluko, nick evans and why because the cardiologists had to take interest because their lack of cardiology service in peripheral center is a huge geographical area so to cover that they started they, they took interest they started training the neonatologists there subsequently they started their programs their training programs and now i think it's very well established, the targeted neonatal echocardiography program. 
and with clear guidelines, curriculum, training, certification, everything. But it is it is not an easy thing, it's an easy skill to learn. You got to spend at least six months to a 12 months, maybe a year, and sometimes I feel even longer. So for a standard neonatal perinatal medicine fellowship, a, a, a fellow or a resident to acquire this skill during this two year, three year period, it's not easy. So it may not be practical for uh, us to train all the fellows into the targeted neonatal echocardiogram. Um, and also, unless there is a strong TN echo program, so unless you have multiple neonatalities or multiple staff does TN echo, it may not serve the hemodynamic assessment, the regular frequent hemodynamic assessment in the sick babies in an ICU. And that is where I felt that we need to move away from TN echo. We will not uh, getting rid of TN echo program, but we need to start something more, more practical, more easy for our day-to-day -day hemodynamic assessment. Critical care lung ultrasound scan, again, as I said, it was completely neglected and it's mainly because lung is an air-filled organ. So your ultrasound will not go through the uh, air and it's gonna reflect, so it's gonna in, in, end up being a, lots of artifact. And that's why. Now, over the last two or three decades, it, it has gained popularity. It started with the adult critical care and slowly sipped into the NICU. And I have to say that NICU has now done really well in terms of doing lung ultrasound scan. And if, if you see the papers and articles, a lot of papers and articles are published from the NICU on lung ultrasound scan. These persons I had the opportunity uh, to meet in Paris, two years now, 2020, Daniel Lichtenstein, he's the adult intensive care and he has developed uh, extensive uh, and experience on the lung ultrasound scan. This is his book. If anybody interested in learning lung ultrasound scan must buy this book. This is almost like a Bible to the lung ultrasound scan book. He developed different protocols, approaches for acute respiratory failure in the adult, in the emergency, uh, how they can diagnose um, the conditions such as embolism, heart, heart failure or stuff like that, or deep vein thrombosis. Uh, I think everybody is familiar with this paper. This paper came out a few years now, quite a few years, by this the whole group from the Europe and the American um, trained cardiologist and the neonatologist beautifully described the training recommendation, curriculums, everything. So we are really grateful you know, for, you know, and to these people for coming up such a good recommendations. 2019, I think Patrick published again, you know, the perspective, the challenges that, you know, how it's not quite easy. So if you are interested, go through this paper. And um, this is the recent paper I found in 2021 uh, by this American group. And what they talked about, they talked about, this is the first paper I think they talked about the point of care ultrasound, not just the echo, not just something else, head, it's as a whole. And they talk about uh, the structure of the training, the quality assurance, everything. Um, in the point of care ultrasounds in an ICU. So what programs do we have in, in our centers? So we have lung ultrasound scan, and I have to say this is the most commonly used point of care ultrasounds. It's very unique because as I said, it's a study of artifacts. Um, and I think lung ultrasounds can help in diagnosis. And it's of course, it helps our timely management in common lung problems such as RDS, TT, and pneumothorax, collapse consolidation efficiency, and some more. And it's very useful in guiding non-invasive and invasive ventilations as well. In terms of hemodynamics and organ blood for Doppler, uh, it is useful uh, for us in terms of rapid assessment of the hypertension shock, and if you suspect persistent fetal circulation or raised PVR, what we do here, we look at the heart in very limited view, which is only four chamber sweep view. If any of you does in a, um, do an echocardiogram, you know, uh, it's a epical four chamber view, sweep view. We use two, two dimensional like 2D pictures, a B mode and the color Doppler. Um, and along with that, if we use the organ blood flow Doppler studies, we study around about uh, on peak systolic velocities, in diastolic velocity, and resistive index. These, these are the indices we study when we look at the Dopplers. It may help us to choose the right volume, right inotropes, or combination. 
And what, where do we assess our organ blood flow? We assess uh, in the brain, anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, in the gut, superior mesenteric, celiac axis, and of course the kidney. So these are the uh, vital organs we study when we do organ blood flow Dopplers. Okay. Neurocritical ultrasounds we've developed, um, it's mainly to detect the major intracranial pathologies in acute scenarios. So baby comes very sick or hemoglobin dropping or high respiratory failure or are requiring multiple anatropes, looking at their brain, mainly looking at that if there is a major IVH or not, or if there is a, a major catastrophic changes in the brain. Also, we use a, a non-invasive assessment uh, um, of the ICP by using the cranial artery Doppler using the resistive index. And we use optic nerve sheet diameter. Um, this is very new and, and I'm not sure how many uh, centers uses this, but we've been using optic nerve sheet diameter for um, some time. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? It says, uh, sign out. Okay, so um, <laughs> one second, I think it's just a technical issue. Okay, um, so the neurocritical ultrasound, uh, uh, ultrasound is uh, basically the, uh, the Doppler and major, you know, and looking at the major uh, um, cranial pathologies, and of course, using this optic nerve sheet diameter. Abdominal focus, um, we use the NIC scan protocol. We've developed a protocol, um, how to study the necrorising intraplatis and the uh, in, in, intestinal uh, motility and the blood flow and the, and, and the uh, wall thickness and everything. So we developed a protocol there. We also look at the ascitic fluid. If there is a big abdomen, that's how we can find out, and if needed, aspiration, we use the ultrasounds to do that. Of course, we have the TN echo service, and I'm not gonna go into detail of the TN echo service. Asma is myself, and we are the two neonatologists fully trained in TN echo, and we are the one who provides the TN echo service uh, for our centers. Okay, um, focus to me, it should be an integrated approach. And what does it mean by that? Number one, we must include the, or incorporate the clinical assessment um, when you are doing the focus assessment, because we need to find out, we need to figure out what clinical questions should we be answering using the point of care ultrasounds. Now, each focus assessment, the lung, the hemodynamics, the organ, gut, brain, they seem that they're all uh, separate, isolated assessment, but I think together it can contribute to the big picture and it's almost like a, you know, the jigsaw in the puzzle. So I think in the sick babies, I'm not saying that we need to do everything for every babies, but in sicker babies, it's, it's very important to have all of this assessment so that we can paint the bigger picture. And I'll give you some example that, um, say for example, if we are assessing a hypertension and we have to know that whether the lung is super inflated or is completely collapsed, um, using the ultrasound, that could be a very important for our management because if it is a too hyperinflated, that will impair the venous return. Similarly, if there's a completely collapse, that will raise the PVR. So it prevents the blood flow through the lung coming back to the left, left heart. And that will uh, cause um, preload issues in the heart. So it's, it's, it's very important. Similarly, if we have a coexistent pulmonary hypertension, whether you call it persistent fetal circulation or raised PVR, that may need to be addressed before we start doing some respiratory management, such as, I'm giving an example, in a, in a seriously respiratory failure, the baby who has got extremely high 
if, if I were to very, very labile pulmonary hypertension, we may want to treat that before we pour surfactant because that will probably cause a significant pulmonary hypertension crisis. On the other hand, if there is a moderate degree pulmonary hypertension, we may not need nitric oxide or anything. We may just have to open up the lung. So I think it's important to assess. In every time I assess the heart, or every time I was, I was called for a heart or hemodynamic assessment, I always start with the lung because lung and the heart, they are kind of um, go together. And similarly, in an effect of hypotension or whether we use, use anotropic agents, and we need to study the organ blood flow to look at the end organ effect. Okay, so we're gonna start some case and we're gonna uh, go through these cases and understand how focus helps us. So case number one, this is a 35 week infant of diabetic mother and around five hours of age and started on CPAP because of work of breathing. If I O2 is not that high between 25, 28%, saturation's okay, uh, just tachypnea, not much grunting and blood pressure is kind of stable, you know, reasonably acceptable blood pressure for 35 weeker. Chest X-ray as usual, just a low lung volume, some streaks bilaterally, but nothing focal, nothing, nothing specific. And we've seen these X-rays, we've seen this clinical picture many times in our life. So this is the X-ray, you can see just a, maybe a low, if you look at carefully, you may say, hmm, I can see maybe some ground glass, maybe not, nothing, nothing much helpful. Now, when we look at the ultrasounds, and I'll show you the ultrasounds picture here, you see the ultrasound showing thick pleura. This is the uh, soft tissue. This is the pleural line. This is the lung here. It's very, very thick pleural line with clumps of white. These are subpleural um, um, collapse or consolidation. And underneath the lung is all white out hazy. So it's all microacrylectasis there. I'm just gonna play the video one more time. So this is very classical of, of uh, RDS. So thick and plural line, subplural consolidation. Based on that, we intubated the baby and we give surfactant because we knew that this is not gonna get better, it may get worse. Why not we treat the, the main disease? Second case, uh, term babies and admitted with uh, increasing respiratory distress. Very quickly, the baby deteriorated, needing ventilation and if I went up through the roof, almost like a hundred percent every time we touch the baby. Chest X-ray again, low lung volume, hazy, non-specific changes. So we couldn't be sure that whether it's a RDS or is it a pneumonia. Um, blood gas, uh, kind of typical mixed acidosis, some you know, CO2, some lactate, some base excess there. And the blood pressure is a little bit of low. There is not much difference between pre and post-ductal saturations. Um, you know, classically for to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, we recommend at least three to 5% above um, um, difference. But sometimes you don't see that if you are significant pulmonary hypertension, you get shunt mix at the atrial level and that will not, and that will be responsible for not having significant pre and post ductal gap. Of course, the baby came back positive with a GBS within 24 hours. We knew that we were dealing with a, a serious GBS pneumonia probably. So this is the X-ray prior to the intubation. You see the, how the lung feels are hazy. And um, I think the baby was on some non-respiratory, non-invasive respiratory support. But this is very non-specific, right? This is, could be just a fluid in the lung maybe, or could be the GBS pneumonia, RDS, whatever you call it. Now this is a term baby you have to remember. So the RDS probably not in the higher in the list. But could it be secondary surfactant deficiency because of the pneumonia? Could be, but it was within the first 24 hours. So we did the ultrasound of the lung and we found clear white out lung, thick and pleura, exactly the same what you saw last time. And there are some subpleural consolidation. I'm just gonna play it again. You see how thicker there and such a white out. So definitely the lung ultrasound can showed us that there was a degree of surfactant deficiencies. So we looked at the heart and what did he find? We did a four chamber sweep view with a color hemodynamic assessment and it shows raised PVR. I'm just gonna play that video here. See the heart four chamber, significant TR. You see the interventricular septum, how it's bowing towards the left ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Um, 
you won't see the duct here, probably mostly right to left sound. I'm just gonna play it one more time. Significant TR, maybe some bidirectional flow at the PFO level, and definitely you can see the interventricular septum is bowing towards the right, uh, towards the left ventricle. So we did a, a TR assessment and we found almost 80, 80 to 90 millimeter of mercury. So that's a supra systemic pulmonary vascular resistance. So how did we manage that? I, I remember this case, we kind of started on nitric first, give some fluid, control the pulmonary hypertension by completely paralyzing the baby, giving some sedation before we thought about giving surfactant. And that is what I'm saying that usually, you know, you, your knee jerk may be saying, okay, surfactant deactivation, you see the lung ultrasound scan, there is a surfactant deficiency picture, let's give surfactant. But in this situation, that could have been uh, very dangerous because the baby is already kind of at the cusp of acute pulmonary hypertension crisis. If we pour some fluid, surfactant is definitely gonna trigger the massive pulmonary hypertension crisis. So we kind of thought, let's treat the pulmonary hypertension if we can, control a little bit, then maybe we can give some uh, surfactant. So that's how what we, it, it helped us. Case number three is a term baby with a moderate to severe HIE on therapeutic hypothermia, blood pressure eh, kind of borderline low there, lactose was very high, and of course there was no urine. If I were to again 80%, not much difference between pre and post acral sats. So we gave a 10 ml per kilo fluid bolus, but there was no history of fetal blood loss. So we were careful not to give too many fluid boluses in case the myocardium is kind of failure. Right. So should we give more fluid? Should we give start ionotropic support? Now, in normally, if we do not have point of care ultrasound scan skill, we may say, hmm, okay, you tried one or two fluid buses, maybe go for anotropic support in the next. Um, which anotrop to choose? Should I choose uh, epinephrine? Should I choose norepinephrine? Should I choose dopamine? Dopamine? The multiple anotropic supports are available, right? So we had to do a, a cardiac uh, picture. So this is our cardiac picture. It's showing significantly pulmonary vascular resistance and decreased LV contractility. Just on the visual inspection, we are not measuring any fancy uh, of, 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 um, uh, you know, the e EF, the ejection fraction, fraction shortening, nothing. We're not measuring anything fancy, but just showing you on the visual inspection, you can easily diagnose there is a significant problem. So let me play the video here. Hang on. Okay. You see how it is, the lead ventricle barely moving, it's almost like a jerking there. There is no definite squeeze here. If I play the color one, you will see significant tricuspid regurgitation, bowing up the interventricular septum, and LV is just trying to squeeze, but it's not actually squeezing. It's more like a kind of titanic convulsion there. <laughs> I'm just gonna play this video and then play one more time here. Significant tear and LV, LV, LV is not at all good. And this is the long axis view of the heart. And again, that also shows that significant, significant re reduction. Sorry, my video clips are very short. Um, I'm just gonna play it one more time. You can see clearly the ventricle is not moving at all. It's not coming close. The walls are not coming close. So based on that, we kind of knew that we have to, we had to manage the pulmonary pressure. We have to start some sort of proper cardiac anotropy. So we chose, I think, epinephrine directly. You could have chosen dobutamine as well, but it, it helped us to decide the right anotropes. And suddenly in this situation, I'm not gonna give any fluids because look at the late ventricle is not moving at all. Case number four, 34 weeks, a premature a congenital syphilis. I don't know what your experience nowadays, but nowadays we are seeing congenital syphilis coming as like a SARS there, like a systemic inflammatory response. They are very sick. And this baby came with a pancytopenia, drained liver function and big abdomen, big ascites. There was not much of pleural effusion, but abdomen was big. We initially thought the baby has high drops. Now I, we talked with the, our infectious disease specialists and they are saying these babies usually would die if you keep the pregnancy going. They will be resulting as a stillbirth. So because we are getting these babies early, they are coming at, out as a very, very sick baby. So baby was ventilated, high pressure, high AFIO2. Initially brain scan, we did a brain scan because baby was so sick, didn't show anything there. Second week of ventilation, 
baby continued to be very sick. So we're questioning that, what are we doing here? How long, how, how, how many more days should we keep going? So at, the, at that moment, it was, I think it was, I was doing blood round and I just looked at the brain and look what I found here. The brain showing massive bilateral hemorrhagic infarctions with the midline shifts. I've got another picture, the coronal view, the sagittal view. It's a kind of disaster in the brain. So based on that, we immediately talked to the family. And we are, of course, we got the radiologist doing the scan. It's not just my picture to confirm my findings. And then we talked to the neurologist, we talked to the, uh, the parents, and we decided to discontinue the life support in this baby, unfortunately. Okay, case number five, a 32 weeks premature severe IGR, less than third centile. And this, of course, as usual, baby is on TPN. We couldn't get a high UVC or the peak line, so we got a little bit of low UVC there. We thought, okay, let's start with that and maybe we'll switch to a peak line later. And we started feeding a little bit, very cautiously because of the significant IUGR. Second week of life, this baby developed severe, like a big abdomen, tight abdomen. Did an X-ray, just a gasless, nothing. There's no gas there. So we thought, okay, maybe baby developed, developing necrotizing enterocolitis. A little bit early, but the baby is severe IUGR. Otherwise, the baby was hemodynamically stable, normal CRP, normal platelet, lactate, and the blood glucose, everything is fine. So there is no stress kind of response from the baby and um, so we obviously we started on antibiotic npo started on some nd suctions just for the following the nick protocol now i did the ultrasounds of the abdomen just because i'm interested in there and what did i find here so this is the abdomen abdominal wall and you see a big pocket of fluid here and if you look at the fluid at the bottom, it looks like a something white granular. It's like a floating around here. I'm just gonna play it one more time, right? And this is the liver and you've got a subhepatic collection there, intrahepatic sub, intrahepatic collection. So as soon as we saw that, we thought, okay, let's put a needle under ultrasounds and let's see what's in there. And we got this. So the baby is suddenly, you know, clearly extravasated. TP and extra in the tummy. Now, if you, you, you probably all have seen these cases, but the beauty of the using of the ultrasound was that as soon as we saw that, we were continuing neck treatment, but we repeated the scans after a couple of days. Look at the liver, his back here. There's not much of fluid and baby remains stable. So we kind of cut short our neck treatment and everything. It was not neck, it was just purely a TP and extra Baby started to get better within 48 hours and we started feeding. So it definitely shortened and redirected our care, clinical care in this situation, because I knew that this is a clear TPN, not the ne necrotizing enterocolitis. Case number six, um, term baby placental abruption, it required some degree of resuscitation, PPV, and baby is now intubated. Cord gas pH wasn't too low, 7.09, and subsequently when we did the gas from the baby, within one hour it was 12, so it was high lactate. Now, baby did not meet all the criteria for cooling, so should we cool? So we started monitoring the baby using the cerebral function monitoring, the CFM. It shows mild to moderate. It's a broad band, lower border hanging around at eight, upper border just above 10, but there is no sleep-wake cycle. So we cannot classify it as a clearly moderate or severe degree for sure. So we looked at the cerebral artery Doppler resistive index and look at the Doppler index here is quite low, 0 0.36. In um, classic HIE, moderate to severe HIE, there are articles from Bristol and group, they found that less than 0 0.55, it's uh, suggestive of moderate to severe HIE. So that was definitely moderate plus HIE there. So we started coding based on that. Now, as soon as we started cooling within the first 24 hours, you can see the RI is improving a little bit, not quite normal, but it's better. Second day of the life, second day of the cooling, we look at the middle cerebral artery and we see the RI is getting higher. Is it because the baby is getting better, changing everything with the cooling, or is it something else? Now, with the HIE babies, we also look at the optic nerve sheet diameter. So we did the optic nerve sheet diameter we found the optic nerve sheet diameter increase. This is the clear picture here with zoomed. It looks bigger here, but that is actually the bigger. You look at the measurements here, 0.45. So 
So in our centers, we published now two articles uh, establishing a nomogram of the optic nerve sheet diameter in preterm to the term babies. And we know in term babies, the maximum diameter could be 0.44. So 0.45 was going above the normal. So we thought there must be of cerebral edema developing. Because of the cerebral edema, the RI is getting normalizing now. It's going towards high RI, which is the classic of the raised ICP. So based on this finding, we redirected our care in the sense we were very aggressive in terms of controlling the ICP. So we use hypertonic saline, use the lower CO2, hit midline and all those things. So that definitely helped us in terms of guiding our management. So how poker scale changed my clinical practice? So for the first few years when I started here, I was using POCUS isolately. So after the water round, I'll go around, make a list and do ultrasounds. But although it did bring some objectivity in my clinical assessment, in our clinical assessment, I could not engage the team because once you've done the ultrasound round, everybody's gone. Then you do your ultrasound, then you try to find out the dietitian, the RT, you talk to them. So we, I could not get the team engaged. So over the last two years, Asma knows and what I do here, I perform ultrasounds during the ward round while I'm listening to the report. So I start with the lung, then move to the fourth chamber view, then look at the organ, brain, and quickly look at the abdomen in some cases. It takes me around two to three minutes. You may say, okay, this is too fast. How do you do that? Now you practice it, you're gonna get it. And, and think about it. I'm not doing the whole body scan, detail scan, like the cardiologist. I'm looking at very, very focused scan. So it's possible to do it. And based on this clinical report and my focus finding, then we can decide the clinical management. The team, when I asked them that how they felt about that, they felt very engaged. The RT gets their information on lung right away so that they can make a decision on their PEEP management, respiratory management right away. Dietitians often say that, okay, duct is big. Do you have a reverse flow? So maybe I should not feed, feed very fast. So all of the decisions can be made at the ward round. Now, this is the million dollar questions I know. And if people will ask me that, you know, you're talking too much of focus, you're too passionate, very enthusiastic. Does that improve the clinical outcome? Maybe the short term, how about the long-term outcome? So there are two ways to answer this. You can be aggressive and you can say, well, we've been using TST X-ray, normal blood count and electrolytes for many, 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 many years. Have they proven? Have we got any evidence that doing chest X-ray and CBC and full blood count get, you know, makes our long-term outcome? No, there is no evidence, you know, such evidence like that. But we still do it, right? Because we think that's more scientific, more logical. So why are you picking on me? Now, that's the nasty way. That's the aggressive way of you know, um, answering. But there is another way of answering these questions. And I choose to do that. So to me, my, I, I would like to ask this question, does POCUS give me a prompt clinical information? Does it give me precise, accurate information? Can it provide some early diagnosis? Is it reliable? And of course, it has to be reproducible because I'm not the only one who will be doing that. I have a full team. If I do not have the inter-observer agreement, how that's going to help? So if I have these questions right, and if they are yes, towards yes, then I should use focus in my clinical practice. Okay, what we found and we felt that the benefits of focus in our center, that especially the lung, because the lung disease is the most prevalent, significantly reduced the number of accidents, almost one third to a half. We still use test x to confirm the line position, the ATT position and the first diagnosis, but subsequently the follow-up x-rays are much, much less. And in many cases, the babies are stable on CPAP or something, that there is nothing going wrong. We don't even do the chest x-ray. Lung ultrasound can, should be enough for the diagnosis. Definitely using the hemodynamic assessment, we now choose appropriate volume, anotropes, and that definitely improved. We also use the near infrared spectroscopy for our integrated hemodynamic assessment. Borderline HI, when there are doubts whether we should cool or not, the Doppler RI, I have been using Doppler RI and it's definitely useful. Suddenly before cooling, once the cooling starts, the Doppler RI uh, will lose its positive predictive value. You just have to remember that. Doppler RI suddenly helped us in deciding management of hydrocephalus. So many times the neuro, neurosurgeons are reluctant to put a drain or to go for shunt. And 
here with the Doppler RI, we can convince them that, see, we have a significantly raised ICP, which is affecting your brain or fusion. So we should do something about it. Incorporating, incorporating lung ultrasounds can scoring white out lung with the Dopplers, it definitely aids in terms of PDA management. That's a kind of another you know, extra point uh, uh, to decide to make a decision about hemodynamic significant PDA. Um, so who do we have at JPCH? Our team focus, uh, all our in-house staffs, nurse practitioner and six clinical associates, they're fully trained to do a lung ultrasound scan. And some of them do hemodynamic assessment. Transport team now uses portable lung ultrasound scan and they are fully trained. Oh, whole, whole transport team is fully trained. And we have an app we can interact live uh, during the scan. Resuscitation team can use our butterfly portable scanners during recess for lung recruitment and heart rate detection. And most of our neonatologist group have been trained to perform some, some form of focus, mostly lung, some do hemodynamics as, as well. Now, the equipments, what we use, we have Sonocyte export and for the main focus in the in ICU. This is the Lumify, which goes into any Android device. That's the uh, device they use for the transport. You can use your Android phone, tablet, Samsung, anything. And um, Flips Epic 5, we have this is for our mainly for the echocardiogram, but we have enough probe to use for other Dopplers as well. And this is butterfly we use for quickly going to the resuscitation or you know, out of an ICU. This is Karthik, one of our CAs uh, doing scans in the, this is the old unit, this, uh, no, I think this is the new unit and this is the old unit. <laughs> um, how did we get there? So it's fascinating that, you know, I've been talking about all of these and it's clear that we've achieved something, you know, over the last few years, but how did we do it? Now, I have to say this will take time. This will not be happening overnight. So perseverance, communication with your team and do the same thing again and again and again, and then you'll get there. We've started in 2015 and still developing our program. There's still there are programs are developing such as NAIC program is ongoing development. Definitely not everybody's trained to do NAIC scans and not everybody to train to do our Dopplers yet. So we are getting there. In the initial phase, we train the trainers and then continue to train the other frontline staff. Now, this is the, the you know the most important message i'd like to give it all of you the training the frontline staff in-house staff is absolutely necessary to gain maximum benefits from the, from the progress program we cannot have one two or three new least you know very special they come it cannot be you cannot provide 24 7 focus program to make progress program 24 7 available you got to train as many as staff possible so we have to alter our training program, our focus of thought, chain of thought, everything has to be different. So training pathways, how do you do that? You attend a lecture series or a workshop, then you find a supervisor. This is exactly what we did. And then there are minimum number of supervised scans depending on each module. So long 25 scans, hemodynamic 25 to 30 scans. So we have those numbers set. Limitation of the training, because we cannot train too many people at the same time because of obvious reasons. And of course, you have to fix a training period. You cannot just start training and keep going over years and years. No, that's not going to work. And during this training, they will be reviewed by their peer, by one of us, by some of us, and critical appraisal. They, they go through the article, their images all, all together. During this training, we provide feedback on reporting skills, communication skills, how they're handling the babies, the sepsis control, equipment setting, how they're and image acquisitions and the quality of the image and everything. Now, at the end of the training, they sit for exit exams. I have a written exam, ACQ, and I have an old video OSCE. And we have a practical test. There are two examiner or two observers will be um, um, marking them. And the minimum pass mark is 80%. And of course, the aim is to complete by six months. So uh, this is a kind of evaluation for the point of care ultrasounds. So you see competent improvement required comments similarly. So this is the whole, I've got a lot of points there. Now, maintenance of certification competence. There is no formal certification other than College of Radiologists or Australian Society of Ultrasound Medicines. So they have that, but nothing like that. So we developed our own standard and accreditation process. We decided that we need to have at least 20 scans per year to maintain the uh, competencies uh, for the focus. 
We do focus workshops and what we do since 2019, we've been administering focus workshops in Canada and internationally. It's usually a two days full workshops, which includes didactic lectures, some hands-on skill sessions. And at the end of the workshop, there is a test, MCQs or quiz, whatever way you do it. And then we provide feedback to them and we take feedback from them as well. So this is kind of giving a kind of quick and kind of overview what we uh, what our focus program looks like, workshop look like. This is the uh, program we are going to be doing in Manchester in coming August. And this is the day one ultrasounds is long, day two is hemodynamics, and all the topics are there. How are you going to do that? And of course, it's the full day program, full two days program there. Now, we've been training, uh, and, you know, and as I said, we, we, we've started in, we went to Singapore in November 2019. Of course, after COVID hit, we could not go many places, but we've been doing training in Edmonton in Canada. We, we are part of the Focus Neo uh, group and, and we accept pediatricians and neonatalists from the other centers and the fellows as well for short term training. So one to two weeks for each module. So sometimes they come learn only lung, learn only hemodynamics or combine them in, but not everything altogether. So it, they get enough hands-on experience and skills. Upcoming workshops. As I said, Manchester coming there, India maybe next, and then there are other centers we haven't decided, I haven't got the time yet, but hopefully soon. Singapore moment, these are the Singapore we are talking. This is Cindy uh, uh, in the, she's one of our nurse practitioner, fully trained now as an instructor. And where is Asma? Right, she's there. <laughs> and this is us between the course, we're chilling a little bit, having the fun. All right, so summary, the integration of different focus skills may improve to be beneficial in improving clinical care. Focus skills certainly brings the objectivity to our assessment. Now, starting program, it definitely requires full engagement. You cannot just start by yourself. You have to engage the all staff, including nursing, not just the medical. And remember, slow and steady wins the race. So this is our focus uh, presentation for today. And if you have any questions, please share. Just on time. Yeah. Can I say something or? Absolutely. Please go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Um, first of all, I introduced, first of all, thank you very much for a comprehensive one here. Uh, my name is Dr. Adnan Mirza. I'm one of the uh, neonatologists working in Aga Khan University Hospital, Pakistan. Very nice to meet you. <laughs> Same here. And I have a privilege to work with Asma as well when she was with me in Limerick. Very good. Yeah, that's right. Uh, my question over here, first of all, I have two, hmm. two questions. And one, uh, yeah, the, the ultrasound you have been started and doing frequent basis on the best side, would, wouldn't you believe that it may take the person uh, and the evening time or the night time to do a cross check or confirmation of the findings in the evening time plus? Do you, did, do you come across any time that their findings make a false judgment at any time in the early, early period of their training? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Now, again, you know, you probably can totally agree that different focus has different learning curve. Now, I can talk about the, uh, the hemodynamics. It's not easy. So sometimes, you know, the training. Now, as I said, the, when they're training, they are always supervised by one of us. So that's, there is a checkpoint there. Now, of course, we have come across that they've said something, they've done something, as you said, in the evening, in the middle of the night. I'm not there um, unless, now, <laughs> what sometimes they do, I'll tell you, they take picture and they send me, if I'm on call, they send me a picture, a video clip. Yeah. And I see that, and that's something we can do. But you were absolutely correct because there are situations, they've done that, and next day morning, I said, hmm, I don't know, or maybe I wouldn't have done that. Now, that's true for high-skilled training like a focus now ultrasound of the lung it's so easy and i can tell you that we we trained we started in 2015-16 not a single time i found that they were making something completely irrational or completely out of the blue kind of management 
it's easy. So it depends on the focus scale. If the focus is easy to learn, then there will be less inter-observer variability or less you know, disagreement between the learner and the trainer. But of course, if it becomes the hard, if you're looking at the brain, the Dopplers particularly, unless you do the right angle, right gait and everything scale, it, it definitely have some effect. So yes, there is. So that's why we, we say, do not um, exclude your clinical assessment. So you do your focus and thinking about a clinical question, but if it doesn't match, then do not use that focus finding. Discard that or park it aside, use your clinical assessment, do what your clinical assessment tells you to do. And maybe discuss the picture next day that, you know what, I saw something which didn't make sense, much sense. What do you think? Can I, you know, should we go through this picture? So that's, that's what I think we've done. But of course, there will be times where there will be disagreement and you may think that, hmm, I wouldn't have done that. Does that answer your questions? Uh, Daspal, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, so just a brief introduction. My name is Dr. Sajid. And okay. basically, I did my initial neutral fellowship from Bristol St. Michael's, and then I ended up doing pediatric cardiology fellowship from Southampton, UK. So wow. in Pakistan, for the last, in the Pakistan for the last five years, I have followed almost copied your pattern and my nurses, they are doing the point of care ultrasound, the echo and the head ultrasound as well. But what we are really lagging behind is in the lung ultrasound. So my question to you is that what particular probe you are doing for lung ultrasound because I've got two echo machines in my NICU. And do you think that the S8, S5 or S12 probe, which we use in echocardiogram, they can be used for lung ultrasound? That is the first question. And second question is that the, I'm very interested uh, to buy this Butterfly IQ Plus. So what do you think, what you compare the color Doppler and the other parameters that is it good to spend money on IQ Plus and bring it in Pakistan if I can use it? Do you think it's a good gadget? All right, thank you. Okay, very nice to meet you, Sajid. I mean, this is, uh, and, and St. Michael's, the hospital, I did not work. I was training in South Mid, <laughs> but we do have some connection yes, there. Yes, when there was a drift trial going on, you know, drift yes, trial. I, I, yes, 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 I was drift, there, yeah. Drift there, Toby trial and everything was there. And you probably worked with the Mariana Thorson. I never yes, I worked, worked with, with I worked with her, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So good, so good. Okay, so to answer your first question, lung ultrasound scan, you need a, a linear, a linear probe because if yes, you yes, use, yeah. yeah. So you cannot have the sector probe because you need to have a good longitudinal. Can you see me? Yeah, you need yes, a longitudinal. Yes, yes, can yeah, you can need a longitudinal area where you can assess the plural line. So yes, okay. uh, the sector won't work. So anything along with your frequency, you don't need a low frequency. You need around 10 to 12 to 15 frequency. And okay. the other thing is if you use two fancy machines, because they use this, um, this kind of you know, um, fancy machine, what they do, they, get, they try to get rid of the artifacts. Uh, the ultrasound mm -hmm. lung is a full of artifacts. So if you yes, make yes. it more, oh, nice, crystal clear crisp images, that doesn't answer our question. So you need to have a crude, uh, full of artifact picture. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two is butterfly IQ. It's good for extremely low resources hospital. It's heavy. The probe is heavy, extremely heavy. It generates too much of heat. And so if you are using in a baby, small baby, uh, be careful you know, for the skin burn and stuff like that. Color mm. Doppler is not good. Um, it's like a, um, when I'm using it. It's, but again, having said that, what's your purpose? If you say, you know what? I just want to look at the heart. Is it contracting or not? I just want to look at the heart, whether it's filled or underfilled. If we are mm. only doing very basic kind of assessment, but if you are, because you're trained fully in cardiology, you know, you will be <laughs> pissed off at the <laughs> pictures and everything. What the hell? What am I doing here? But no, okay. but depending on what, 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 what you want to use. It's very handy and it's cheap. It's 4,000, 5,000 Canadian dollar and you get the subscription. So it is cheap and you can put it on iPhones or anywhere. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And the last bit is that I would really appreciate if you leave your email and the sources from where I can get the idea about this lung ultrasound and other, other bits and bobs you're telling about so that I can improve myself as well and my team. But uh, just to say that the minors is they, 
just to answer the Dr. Anand question as well, they do the ultrasound at night. And what they usually do is that the, when they do, I have got cams in my NICU as well, and I can focus on the echo machine from there, or we can use the, uh, you know, the WhatsApp. So they put the WhatsApp focus on the uh, echo machines, and I can just guide them from my home that whether we are missing something or not. So uh, I think that's a great achievement. So I will appreciate if you leave your email and the resources from where I can get the lung ultrasound. Yeah, that is absolutely, absolutely. I, I will let Asma to share my contact details with you, so that Fantastic. you can contact me. Brilliant, you brilliant, can, you brilliant. Can contact me anytime. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Sajid. Which hospital are you working? We can you take them outside, please? This is bugging me here. Constantly knocking doors. And me was here, panting. Doctor Sajid, which hospital are you working in? Okay, we have uh, Mohammed Abu Zaid. Uh, he has a question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Doctor, for the amazing talk. Uh, my name is Mohamed Ouzaid. I'm uh, working in uh, National Guard Hospital, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I just want to ask about the transcranial uh, Doppler. Uh, can we use the transcranial Doppler to help us in uh, the decision of treatment of hypotension, whether to treat or not to treat? Because we face many uh, premature babies with hypotension, and we just get, sometimes we give boluses and give uh, inotropes uh, based on the blood pressure reading. So can we use the transcranial Doppler as additional tool to help to guide us in the management of hypertension to treat or not to treat for this? Yes, Thank I you. think you, you can. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. So see, this is something you know, becoming more and more um, clear that not all hypertension needs to be treated. And again, if you choose to treat with volume or whatever, it can be equally dangerous because we've got papers and articles showing that the baby who had the the bad neurological outcomes were treated with volumes and, and inotropes. Now, it could be chicken and egg kind of effect. There. So what we do, we use the near infrared spectroscopy that again tells us the oxygen consumption. The, so that definitely prevents further. Now, how are you going to use the Doppler? I think what you can do, you can use the Doppler looking at the peak systolic flow, the end systolic flow, the RI, and definitely, if you see that Doppler is, because there is some degree of cerebral autoregulation uh, um, exist. I, again, it may be lost in a very premature case, or in, it may be gone in a very sick babies, but there is some degree. So unless you do a cerebral artery Doppler, whether the ACA or through the MCA, through the, you know, the uh, fontanel here, I think that definitely helps in terms of making a more um, logical decision, more like a, you know, um, educated decision rather than just throwing an up. So yes, you can do that. Hello, yeah. Asma, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Actually, I was muted, so I was really struggling what to say when you are just inquiring where I'm working right now. So just to give you a brief introduction, so I moved from uh, UK in 2016 and uh, I joined a War Medical College where I'm working as an assistant professor and War Medical College has got two hospitals. One is PUF hospital, which is 600 bedded, but there is another attached hospital, which was a small, uh, basically mother and care unit with a eight cot special care unit. So in last five years, uh, myself and my fr friend who worked in Manchester is a pediatric neurologist. We have transformed it from a special care baby unit to a level three unit with 10 ventilators. We have got CPAPs, high flow, low flow, micro flow, and all echo onsite EEG. And this is the stuff which we are doing. We are still lagging behind in many areas, but this is what we have done in the last five years. I was in Islamabad for five weeks in January. And how did I not know that? Because I always thought that you work in Saudi Arabia. I'm so sorry. I just made it up. And I would have definitely interacted with you if I have known that. No problem. I'm sure that was not your last visit to Pakistan. You will come again. So no problem. <laughs> and hi, Dr. Mirza. I, it's really nice to see you. I was muted while you were talking, but it was... Uh, um, he was my, uh, I must say, trainer when um, I was his uh, senior house officer uh, in my early days. 
Um, we have uh, Hamza Sajid. He has raised his hand. No, no, that, that, actually, this is my uh, son's, uh, you know, the login. So I am Sajid. I'm talking right now. So oh. I will appreciate if you share, uh, you know, Dr. Despal details well, because he worked in South Mir, which was just adjacent to St. Michael's where I worked. So I think if this is the beginning of a new relationship in which we can learn from Canadian expertise and we can just try to transform and utilize in our country as per our limited resources. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, I had um, actually, I'm, I'm kind of new to the lung ultrasound. I, I trained in ECHO, but uh, um, I didn't take the lung ultrasound or um, that seriously until I started working here. So mm -hmm. I have looked into the options of uh, bringing Sebastius to Pakistan, but I think given the restraints around the visa, but that could be just me and uh, the limited information I have get gathered. But um, I think we can explore it further if we need some um, support from uh, ministries or our tourism department where we can um, promote or, or kind of facilitate his visit to Pakistan. Um, but mm -hmm. definitely, so in terms of sharing the information, I can, uh, um, I will definitely definitely send it in the group. The second option is also that uh, Sebastius, I, I, I don't think he talked about it, but what he has done with the Manchester group is that he has done the virtual webinars with them. And um, it's a series of webinars. And then he's practically going there uh, for hands-on uh, practice um, in summer this year. So we can, we can certainly look into those webinar series here too, uh, because we are actually quite frequent group to meet almost every week. Um, so we can, we can certainly look into once a month option or uh, once every six weeks. Um, so yeah, definitely. But in terms of sharing the contact details, I will share his email. Um, actually, you know, the, in, in Pakistan, we have got less than 100 uh, pediatric cardiologists. In, you know, the, it's a huge population. So what I think is that the neonatologists in Pakistan, that's the future if the cardiologists, they are a bit, you know, cooperative, collaborative, they can just create these programs, focus programs. So what I have done in my area is I've tried my best to train a good number of the juniors, but definitely we don't have a very specified structure program, but doing something is always better than doing nothing. So inshallah, with your help, we'll improve, no problem. Very good idea. I have Asad Makbul, he has raised his hand. Can I also talk to Dr. Asma, mm -hmm. Dr. Asad Makbul? Yes, it's your turn. No, no, you want to, to talk. I'm Dr. Sajjad Rahman from Saudi Arabia. Sir, uh, would, would you, why don't you go first, sir? I'll follow. Yeah, no, sir, you can go first, please. Right. Uh, a very nice talk, uh, Dr. Daspal, and it was uh, very inspiring. I have two very simple questions. One is, uh, can we use or do you use the IVC diameter when uh, looking at the underfill, overfill, and whether to give fluids and uh, inotropes? And the second thing is, uh, we've started to play around with the uh, lung ultrasound in our unit. We have a very old machine that has a cur curvy linear probe, but we're right. able to uh, did uh, find out the B lines and A lines and even the consolidate uh, subplural consolidation. So it's helped us uh, a lot, especially in serial monitoring. So what do you think about a curvy linear probe uh, uh, for lung ultrasound? Absolutely. And the, uh, and, and the IVC, yes. I'll answer both yeah. of your questions. Thank you very much. Very nice to meet all of you, actually. <laughs> um, so curvy linear probe, yes. You know, it, if it is, you know, enough, like a um, diameter or the length and as long as you can see a little bit of you know uh, the plural that definitely helps you're already been you know so if you cannot old men don't say you you probably have the best machine for the lung <laughs> old machines are the best machine for lung as i said you know it's a full of artifacts so that's good now coming back to your ivc yes so our hemodynamic assessment, uh, uh, Dr. Magbul, is not just the four chamber. We teach them to the look at the IVC, the IVC diameter, IVC collapsibility, and of course the four chamber. The problem I have with the IVC is this, with all those articles on the IVC size, the collapsibility index, and all those fancy indices, 
they are on based on an adult mostly some pediatric but they're all non ventilated now if you have a baby who is ventilated and you put a peep and your chest is inflated or collapsed that will change your ivc so i've seen that babies on oscillation or jet or significant high intrathoracic pressure the ivc looks big and is not collapsing is the big but actually your heart is completely underfilled if you look at the right ventricle you cannot assess right ventricle that way but if you look at the left ventricle is all flat collapsing there is nothing in the heart you do an x ray you see the heart is just like that and the whole chest x ray lung is big heart is that but your ivc will look big so what do you do so that will give you a so unless you look at the heart whole only by looking at the ivc in a baby who's ventilated or in a patient who's ventilated may not be that reliable if that answers your question hello i think i'm so connected to i got muted so i thank you very much for your answer thank you thank you, thank you. very good doctor ajan uh, rahman as well Yeah, I am Dr. Sajjad Rahman uh, from Saudi nice Arabia. To, nice to meet you. Yes, consultant to the ontologist, uh, working in a senior position as clinical director of the NICU. And it was a very impressive uh, presentation, Despard. I must thank say a lot of thanks to you. Thank you. And uh, learned a lot from uh, your presentation today. Oh, thank you. Thank and you very let much. Let me say a lot of thanks to Dr. Asman Ashirwan as well for organizing this uh, session. um when we trained probably uh, let me say it was old days i also trained in scotland and then in uh, hospital for sick children in toronto where i did my fellowship but the things have changed significantly and i think this is the time that we should focus on our juniors and uh, equip them with the new skills which you have presented this is different century and different time and so we have started focusing on that i don't have any question about your presentation except to appreciate that you have reduced the number of access you are doing thank which you i think is much. a very very big achievement uh, less radiation exposure and um, hopefully less uh, morbidity and also was impressed that you are doing the ultrasound during your ward round thank I'm you sure very this much. is because of your day to day practice yes <laughs> and and i believe you have replaced your stethoscope with the probe <laughs> <laughs> you, you just said it you know that's what i exactly i i tell people i did not use that that you know, i think ultrasound is because has become my scope you know uh, to be honest i'm not using it any longer but having said that I, that's what i keep saying that and that's, that's what i say clinical assessment we cannot you know uh, put it aside the good old clinical assessment hands on clinical assessment is just a stethoscope it just giving me another eyes to look at it and that's it yes yes that's nice that's nice and that i think that's very impressive but i think the, we should also need to realize that our new generation of neonatologists have to be equipped with these skills yes and i have been uh, listening to a lot of presentations and focus and we have started building up this skill in our juniors and we'll be grateful to you and dr asma not only for today but also for future uh, collaboration and working together and getting your help help and uh, uh, training i i must and somehow i have to work it out in one or the other way <laughs> how to make it uh, happen i i must any... say dr uh, sajad so sebastian dr sajad is the creator of this group as far as i know and he's okay like <laughs> yeah. i have to um um talk anything about the pro, this what uh, our group um but i i think dr um sajad the 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 uh, saudi arab is not uh, such a difficulty to access right so yeah. uh, i think for me the biggest problem was and as i said that i'm myself new and i consider myself like an advanced learner in this um, uh, focus i must say that um, uh, our main problem was to bring sabasias to pakistan um but saudi arab is definitely a doable thing and we can look into it and in, into this collaboration but uh, definitely i was i i was just going to say something and i lost my train of thought but uh, no definitely we i did dr. mention Asma, okay. yeah dr. Yes. dr asma basically i was waiting for dr sajad to complete these sentences and just i i'm just uh, we are formally inviting him in our khan university hospital in our 
fellowship program if we can do virtually from there and we can uh, train our trainers or first make the supervisors and then we just like one or two neurologists can do these thing um, like our, we have three neurologists over who over train in focus but of course we have to do more advanced thing with these new butterflies uh, 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 as dr sajid was mentioning from wah uh, but i personally think why not we just do the collaboration in our fellowship programs where virtual pre- teaching from your side and from the, this side can make a big big difference in collabor- in co- combination i think i agree with dr uh, atnan uh, prasma i think probably you have tried at your individual level but if we yeah i think if, if if we try it at the institutional level it will be much easier and i don't think there is anything which can stop us from coming to pakistan i'm you know now i'm feeling so bad <laughs> because i'm from india i'm not banned or whatever it doesn't matter and it, it doesn't I know. matter i mean I know. we, I we so are getting you as as a professional <laughs> colleague and we don't care about these things there's a lot to learn we don't care in mean, india as well Yes, I mean, look yeah. at look at here. Asma is one of my best friends, and then <laughs> I can't even. And she wants to come to India. I want to go there. I know this is stupid politics. Who cares, right? We we yeah, are together. I think we will make it something, inshallah. And uh, in Pakistan, we'll get you. And uh, I'm sure Adnan can read it. That's one of the leading institution in Pakistan, the Abu Khan University. Hospital. Thank you. Thank But you. But we can do it in other institutions as well. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. And you're welcome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate. Dr. Vikram is on the. Uh, he's our main yes. host for this uh, webinar. So yeah. And thank you, thank Dr. Vikram, you as much. well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asma's team. And uh, I was unable to pronounce uh, Dr. Speaker's name, so I am not pronouncing. I doesn't want to pronounce wrong. So thank you very much. This was very amazing talk and. Uh, we learned a lot and uh, actually i am uh, telling the scenario we are doing uh, ultrasound head over air with uh, uh, philips lumify and our team is getting trained for pocus eco and we want to improve our practices and uh, uh, for acquiring better images so can uh, we request if we can continue such type of webinars for four to five times more to do uh, on lung ultrasound head ultrasound uh, if it is feasible uh, for you yes absolutely i can definitely i can certainly do that as asma said that that's what i you know we were stuck in the covid we could not go to manchester so they decided you know what how about we do it once a month so i have webinar for rds ttn uh, pneumothorax aerolic syndrome pneumonia collapse consolidation you know how do we use the lung ultrasound scan for <laughs> to improve your non invasive or invasive so yes absolutely we can do that we can talk about hemodynamics in series so sure i mean you know uh, uh, covid have restricted us but have given us these tools to communicate so absolutely i can do that uh, that's well that's yes. well uh, can i say something you know yes. i think what i have, uh, what i have learned is that the air for these uh, you know focus or a screening or a proper ultrasound is concerned you know when we hear we forget when we see we remember but when we do we understand what i think is that unless and until you hold the probe and you know image optimization is one of the very difficult thing to get rid of these artifacts sometimes you can make normal things of normal and vice versa so in pakistan what i have seen is that the in bigger cities we have got at least one cardiology unit if yes. these neonatology units can have a good collaboration with the cardiologist over there then it's a very slow learning curve you know it's not a very quick fix even nowadays there is so much complexity for focus as well that if you want to learn a better way you have to start to have a good coach good coach yes. is very important in the other scenario so Absolutely. that's why what i'm saying is the people in karachi they can fix themselves with their in lahore there is a center in rawalpindi we have got a cardiology as well and i did speak to one of the senior colleagues that the like in uk we have got a spin module you know for one year rotation uh-huh. like the pediatric pediatrician with the cardiology expertise we can have this type of thing in pakistan which will look very better yep we have uh, naila nizami she, um, um, she has raised her hand as well <laughs> Uh, hello i'm naila from lahore Hi. very nice to meet you naila <laughs> uh, same here the, uh, sir i like your presentation and asma assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam 
Uh, sir, you are present. I like the way you presented it because um, learning something new, although focus is not new here in Pakistan, but uh, we actually can't perform it. But I like the way you presented it. It uh, uh, took me to through your presentation very easily. Balke, uh, can you understand Hindi or Urdu? Yeah, <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> 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 Sometimes I just mix it with my uh, 